Well, hey everyone, and welcome to the Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast. I have a really exciting guest lined up today. He's got years of experience as an entrepreneur and a business owner. His name is Henry Lopez. And real quick, a little more about Henry. Henry has done a lot, so hang tight. Henry is a serial entrepreneur and a business coach with over 34 years of diverse business experience, including successful careers in information technology, sales, sales training, real estate, and business ownership. He is currently co-founder of the Levante Business Group. Did I pronounce that right? You did, yes. Levante Business Group, which helps you start, run, and grow a small business. Co-founder of I Top It, a self-serve frozen desserts restaurant in Colorado Springs. Co-owner of Wild Blue Car Wash, which is an exterior express car wash in Colorado. Co-founder of is it Mojave or Mojave? Mojave, but but uh, Mojave. we had, we had a lot of jokes internally about how to pronounce that. So <laughs> either way is fine. Pronunciation is always fun. The Mojave yeah. Systems, which is offering car wash operating system, the task and maintenance management software solutions for the car wash industry, and co-founder of L3 Destinations, which is a travel consulting business, co-founded with his wife. His previous business ventures include owning several pizza delivery franchise units real estate investment businesses, and a suite salon business. Henry is passionate about entrepreneurship and enjoys sharing his knowledge and experiences with others. He lives with his wife in a suburb of Dallas, Texas, and their daughter is attending university in Indiana. Henry, welcome to the show. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, Chris. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I can't wait to dive in. You have so much experience and a very skilled uh, background in various industries as well. Right. I appreciate Pizza, that. Car washing. Let's, let's definitely get into all those juicy details. Absolutely. So real quick, let's go ahead and talk about your background in general entrepreneurship. We talked about some of these questions on a previous call as well. And I thought that it would be good to pick your brain as you've got much more experience than, than I do in this space. So how do you prioritize your time and your tasks among all your different businesses? That is my, my biggest challenge and um, I'm getting better at it, trying to apply different tips and techniques. You know, you and I, you shared some productivity hacks on my show recently. So I'm always trying to get better at it. I, there are some weeks when I do really well and some weeks when I fail miserably. I, I try to plan my week best as possible. I try to block, uh, take an approach of, of time blocking uh, as much as possible. And, and I try to look at what's most important I've gotten myself in trouble with because I'm trying to do too many things at once and you can't do right. it all well. So my partner, my partner, David has helped me with this is what's most important and what can we take off of my plate? What can I delegate? And I'm getting better and better at that, but it's, it's about how disciplined can I be with managing my time on a weekly basis and then on a daily basis. Okay. So it's just something that's like a work in progress, always trying to get better at the prioritization. And focus. That's right. That's right. And again, there's what I try to ask myself at the end of every day, sometimes it's subconsciously, but I try to do purposefully, certainly in, at the end of the week is that I work on the right things that moves me forward, that moves my right. business forward. And if I can answer that as a yes, then that's good. What, what happens a lot, and a lot of people have written and talked about this, that there's stuff that'll fall to the wayside. And sometimes that ends up being noise. What, what seemed like a high priority really isn't. And so what I've found is if you try to focus on the most important things, then you find that the other things weren't really that important. My challenge though is trying not to spend, you know, three hours on something that's fun, but I'm putting aside or ignoring the thing that I have to get done that's important, right? That's a big challenge. Right. And I can't remember if I had asked you this before. Have you read The One Thing by Gary Keller? I have, yes. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that certainly has really helped. Good. Yeah. Definitely. And that was one that was a game changer for me. And it's so easy to keep ourselves busy, keep our plates full. But then at the end of the day, we're like, did we really move the needle? Exactly. And that's what I try to assess. Perfect. I do think that what, where I, where I left my, let myself off the hook sometimes is 
I also have to allow myself to work on things that I enjoy working on. So there are particular projects like this morning, I was working on a project that I'm really enjoying probably because it taps into my creative side. Right. And so it, it, that's okay sometimes, right? It, it, so I, I let myself off the hook sometimes with that. Maybe spent a little bit too much time on designing a particular graphic or a, a, a download piece of content because I love that kind of stuff. I think you got to give yourself some of that sometimes. Absolutely. And I know there's that fine line of this seems too fun. It, it almost seems like work should not be fun because then it's not really work. But that's where you want to be. Where If you can do something that you actually love and it is your work, that's you, you've made it essentially. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I've been doing recently more of that has really helped, and you and I chatted about this because it's I think it's one of your productivity hacks, is to when I set aside a time, a block of time for something, especially something that's hard or requires a lot of thinking, I set a time limit and I stop even if I'm really into it. But I want to I wanna almost stop not wanting to stop rather right. than get to a point where I'm exhausted with that particular task or project, yeah? Yeah, 100%. Sometimes I have that too where I'm in the flow and the timer goes off and I'm like, I just want to do five more minutes. And know. Then, you know, you end up spending another 20 minutes if you don't honor that time. So I think that's extremely important to go by the limit that you Agreed. set yourself. So I'm really curious to find what has been your main motivation when you start a new venture or you decide to pivot from a previous one? Has it been new opportunities that you just couldn't turn down or just out of interest? Or I think it's a combination of all those things. It, it's also a lot of shiny object syndrome. Okay. Uh, it's not always been a good thing. My partner and I unfortunately suffer from the same thing where a new idea comes to us, a new opportunity, like you said, comes our way and it's kind of hard to resist. Uh, we've had to, I've had to, just just because of the reality of my situation, I've had to start to say no more. But yeah, it's a, it's that excitement of wanting to create something new. And that's why, like you mentioned, the variety of my business background. I just love business. Now, there's some types of businesses that I've been in that I enjoy more than others. And sometimes I haven't discovered that until I'm in it. But I love the creation of it, so that's why I get sucked into sometimes with let's do this, let's do that. Um, so that that's why it's just my passion for business and the creation part of it in particular. I think that part's extremely fun as well, and I, I always joke with people that I have so many LLCs that I filed that nothing <laughs> has happened with. I just get excited. I buy the domain name and then nothing happens. <laughs> I, I have got several hundred domain names, so yeah, I suffer from the same thing. Yes. And then you, you spend so much time coming up with the domain name. It's insane. I, so many domain names are taken that you try every variation and then three hours later you found one and then it takes another two months before you start to build a website for it. It's just, it's just funny how that works out. Yeah. Hence why the pronunciation issue with some of my names, because like you <laughs> said, you have to, you have to create names sometimes like Levante is a play on the Spanish word for lift. Yes. And that's what you're left with sometimes uh, when you're searching for a name. You have to be creative. And that's what you notice with all these bigger companies that are just, you know, Spotify, Shopify, they're creating words that you kind of know what they mean, but um, they're made up words so that they can actually get the domain name. That's right. So it's very interesting to see. But you and I talked about this on a recent call. I just wanted to, to see if you could share with our audience what your main driver was to leave corporate America. I know we had some similarities, but I think that there were a few things that stood out more than the other. Yeah, I mean, Chris, I can remember from from forever, I've wanted to be my own boss. I just never knew how to get there, didn't have the resources, didn't have the courage, all of those typical things, right? Had the fears. But I always wanted to be my own boss. And then when I got into the corporate world, even though I did very well, it was the control. I just, I've always had this personality that I hate somebody else controlling me. And it, it we can psychoanalyze that and I know where it comes from, but that'll be another episode. <laughs> that, that people telling me, you know, you and I chatted about it, if I recall correctly, when they when they tell you, you know, you've got two weeks vacation. I'm like, well, that's not gonna work. Right. That's, I may not even not take it for somebody to tell me how much time I could take off. That just always rubbed me the wrong way. But at a broader or bigger level, it was what I came to, what it came to crystallize for me is someone else, my boss, people above that person, arbitrarily deciding a what my limit is, so what what I can produce, what I can do, how much money I can make, even although the money is part of it but not all of it, how much I can create, how much I can do. Somebody putting an arbitrary limit on that, and then somebody subjectively deciding, yeah, we don't need Henry anymore. He's he's you know I've been laid off. I got laid off twice, two different times. 
laid off slash fired, but let's just call it laid off. <laughs> so somebody else arbitrarily deciding, no, Henry, you've got to go, or you, you can't do that. You need to stay in your little bucket here and your, your little box over here. That just always rubbed me the wrong way. I wanted to be the guy who made the decisions. I wanted to succeed or fail on my own account, not because anybody else decided that. I'm sure everyone in my audience can relate to that 100%. Yeah. We all have those issues of, especially for those still working, they're having those thoughts. Whenever I share on my social media as well, people say, this is exactly how I felt, that I wasn't being appreciated. You know, whether I put in 100% effort or 50% effort, I was getting paid you know, the same. What was the motivation for me to really push that hard if I was going to get a little $2,000 bonus at Christmas? That's right. That's every right. Year. And in that environment, what I've also found, Chris, you know, we often, we in the entrepreneurial world, or as you're learning about becoming your own boss, you read a lot about failure is a good thing, right? You got to fail fast. All yes. we, we can read a ton on this topic of failure. In fact, we'll chat about it today, I'm sure. But in the corporate world, the truth is that for most of us in most positions, we really can't fail that much, right? right. Especially if we make some big failures, we're, we're out probably, or our career is over at that particular organization. The truth is that we're, we can't really fail in those environments. And, and that also is so restrictive because what it creates then is then, then you're cautious in a, in a detrimental way in your decision making, right? A hundred percent. And that whole environment, I think, for someone who is who wants to be an entrepreneur, it's suffocating. It really is. And I think that our education system has a lot of that too, where you're Absolutely. always penalized for failing. You know, you don't want to get the F, you don't want your grade in red pen. And that causes you to be scared to try new things because you don't want to fail in front of others. People don't like to fail. And it really Absolutely. takes some training to start saying, okay. I, the faster I fail, the faster I'll reach success. Yeah, I mean, we, the truth is we are indoctrinated that our education system is designed to create employees, not entrepreneurs. That's, that's the reality of it. Um, that doesn't mean you can't break out of it. It doesn't mean you can't study entrepreneurship, but that's, that's the truth of it. That's what the system is designed to do. Definitely. And, and, and so we then have to overcome that for those people like myself who had to go that route or chose to go that route and to get out of it, then it's hard because of, of all, all the perceived safety. And we'll chat about that. I'm sure. Yes. And I know there's a lot of regulations depending on the big business and safety precautions. If you're working in a warehouse or with big heavy equipment, but I'm sure, I don't know if you had the office job, right? I was always in the office. I literally would take safety training and I'd say, none of this is even applicable to me. Am I going to stub my toe on the, uh, the cubicle or something? <laughs> <laughs> So Agreed. Let's uh, jump into the main meat and potatoes of the episode. I appreciate you sharing all that information and just wanted to get oh, a little sure. bit of background on the mindset and how you made the decision to jump into doing your own thing. And you've got a lot of great tips on knowing whether or not one is ready to become their own boss, which is something that many of my listeners are probably struggling with. When is the right time to quit my job? Do I go all in on the idea or do I build it up to a certain level? So how does one know if they are ready to be their own boss? Yeah, that's, that's the million dollar or billion dollar question, uh, right? It's a hard one. I do think at, at, the, at the highest level, Chris, we're, I like to say that we're only ready when we're ready. I know that sounds silly, but in other words, everybody gets to that point I think at a different point in their lives. So there's no right or wrong answer. It could be even before you go to college, it could be at 65 or whatever age. It doesn't matter. Everybody kind of gets their, their own way. Everybody's on their own path. But, but I think the biggest thing we'll start with is overcoming that fear. Uh, and typically it gets expressed as a fear of failure. I like yes. to break it up into two, two types of fear that hold us back from starting our first business. One is all in our head, it's a mindset, and the other one's more real, which is the financial component of it. So let's talk about that one first. There's obviously a real fear that if the way I'm gonna start my business, the only resources I have is to you know, tap into my IRA and or get a second mortgage or line of credit on my house and tap into all of my savings. And yeah, I'm putting myself and potentially my family at financial risk. That's real fear, right? And Absolutely. that's understandable that that should make us at least proceed with caution, if not say, you know what, I got to wait until I've got the resources saved up and let me put a plan in place to get there. 
that's one kind of fear. I, I, that's legitimate fear in my opinion, right? I think so as well. The other side, which is really what typically holds us back because, because that financial fear we can put together for most of us, like, you know, if you're living in abject poverty, I get it. I, I grew up working class at best and I get it that that's easy for me to say. We'll, we'll talk about that. The emotional fear is the bigger one. It's what then manifests itself with excuses like, well, I, I like the safety of my job or I've got benefits. I can't let go of the benefits or on and on and on. But really what I have come to believe and analyze in myself and in people that I've worked with is just a fear of embarrassment that if we fail, we have to tell the people that I guess that matter to us that Oh yeah, I remember that that pizza shop I said I was going to go do. Well, it failed miserably and I'm looking for a job again. That embarrassment, I think, or that fear of that embarrassment is what holds most of us back from getting started. I agree completely. And I'm I'm sure you had plenty of these things. I, is the pizza story true? Is that something that Well, um, the the pizza, let's talk about that. I started that pizza franchise. I kept my job throughout the whole tenure. We had ended up okay. having three locations. I had a partner who we paid a salary and he was working in it full time. We never could get it to a point where I could quit my job financially. Right. Uh, three locations. We sold one very successfully for a profit. We had to shut one down. It was a complete failure. And the third one kind of was a break even. So overall, it wasn't a total failure, but, but I, you know, I couldn't tell the story of, oh yeah, that's what I do now is I, you know, I have multiple franchise units that that was a failure overall. Right. Right. Um, now that could have either said, well, that's it for me. I tried it. That doesn't work because, you know, I don't want to face that embarrassment again or that failure again, or, you know, you say it is what it is. I'm going to learn from it and move forward. And take those lessons to your next thing. Yeah, they yeah. all build on each other. Every yeah. single failure and lesson you learn is something you're not going to fall for in the future. Yeah. I, I've made this observation, Chris, and, and I want to make sure I explain it correctly so it doesn't get misunderstood. Right. I think that other people who are, have the jobs, even our coworkers, if, if we're talking about our work, if we decide to go off and start our own thing, I think that subconsciously sometimes they want us to fail not maliciously, not purposefully, only because it justifies to them, see, that's why I didn't take that risk. Yes. And, and I think you don't want them to say conspires against us. Yeah. It, it all, it, the system conspires against us, right? To, to tell us that, oh, that's risky. But in fact, I'm not a risky person. I'm not a big risk taker. That's the, one of the big misconceptions about entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I make very educated uh, decisions. And yeah, there is always a component of risk. But to me, of course, it's easy for me to say now on this side, what's risky is working for somebody else who tomorrow could decide they don't need you anymore. And now, you know, for me, go try and find a job at the same pay level at, fi at the age 55, right? Exactly. That, and not having right. other streams, that's other right. streams of income. I mean, if that's your only source and you're relying on them and your loyalty for being there for so long, then you're going to be in trouble whenever the economy changes and they're looking at numbers on a spreadsheet and your name is crossed off the list. That's right. So fear is that emotional fear, that fear of really of embarrassment mm -hmm. is I think the biggest thing that holds people back. Yes. And then the financial piece as well is what can, they can kind of justify and say, oh, I'm not ready yet. That's but true. They, they may also be paralyzed by making a plan to figure out how to get to that position. So I think it's a combination of those fears that hold a lot of people back. Good point. So let's move into the next question here, which is what are some questions that someone can ask themselves to know if they're ready? Right. And we, we talked about the risk when I'm looking at my notes here, uh, you know, that I like to, we talked, you touched on planning. My saying is, do you have a solid plan to succeed? So, or have you thought through it and have a plan for success? Okay. Even if, even if it's to succeed, to get yourself to the point where you are financially in a position to take this, make this move, but are you prepared to fail? Because I think what happens sometimes is people think that you can analyze something or research something or plan to the point where there's no chance of failure or I'll go with the franchise and that means I won't fail. Well, that's, that's not how it works. Failure is a high probability in business. So what we do as entrepreneurs and as business owners, like you do, let's say individually when you're analyzing a property, 
you're mitigating that failure, right? So often what we do is we're not going to necessarily put all of our chips in on this one opportunity because we know there's a real chance of failure. So what, what is the worst case scenario if it fails? And that often is a question that I ask people is, if you quit your job and you start this business and it fails two years from now, what is, what is that situation look like for you? What is that worst case scenario? And what I have found, and this goes back to that fear, qualifying what's the real fear. If the answer is, this will ruin me and my family financially, I won't be able to send my kids to college, I'll have to declare bankruptcy, that's not good, right? Yeah, <laughs> that, not That's good at not all. what we are motivating people or, or encouraging people to go do. That takes some real analysis of the numbers. But if your worst case scenario is, I'm going to be embarrassed and I'm going to have to go find another job, but you know what? It'll be no problem. I'll find another job. Then how, how bad is that really? What are you really afraid of there then? Yeah. Right. It's a, it's a false fear. It is. It is. So, so what is that worst case scenario is another good question. Okay. Um, and then do you have confidence in yourself? We, we started at the outset as talking about our motivation for leaving the corporate world. I think we get to a point where, yeah, we, we may not have confidence in our skills yet to run a small business, understandably. Uh, we may not even understand completely a particular industry, and that might be a valid reason to go with a franchise, let's say. Mm -hmm. But I do have to have confidence in myself and be willing to bet on myself that I will put in the effort to learn, to get help. And, and it won't be for lack of effort. I have the confidence that I can, and I have a high probability for success. So I think you have to ask yourself that question. Do you have that confidence? Now, confidence is a tricky thing because confidence doesn't always come first. Courage comes first. And courage is that I'm going to do something even though I'm afraid of it, whether it's afraid of the shame of failure, but I'm going to take action anyway. That's courage and then comes confidence, right? That's a tricky thing there, that, that what comes first. But do I believe in myself? Do I believe that I have the wherewithal to make this happen? I think that's a critical question as well. Definitely, and I think that can take some time for us to build, especially when you're molded into that factory worker mindset, employee mindset, where just you know do what you're told, here's the box that you sit in, don't think outside of it it can be difficult to know, do I really have the confidence? Because you're kind of living in fear of, oh, is the company going to like this? Is my boss going to like this idea? Or if I made this mistake, what's going to happen? It's an awkward conversation to have. And whenever you're doing your own business or being your own boss, I mean, you've got to have the confidence that you can even hold yourself accountable because nobody else is looking over your shoulder anymore. It's all that's up right. to you. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think one of the ways you can alleviate that is either by maybe partnering with someone yeah, uh, or getting a business coach like me or you or a, a mentor or multiple mentors. That's what will help you overcome that. A hundred percent. And I'm starting to learn more and more the value of having coaches in every area of life because people are experts in their fields. It's hard to be perfect at everything. So you can just shortcut by hiring people who are good at the thing that you want to get at and who have done that for years and tap into their knowledge. Yeah. And you touched on a point as well that, that accountability. And so the reason I enjoy working in partnership with, with my partner, David in particular, who I, who I trust and respect is when I'm down, when I'm not feeling confident, I can lean on him to give me some of that when I need somebody's advice or, or help me develop a particular skill or whatever it might be, it's good to have that confidant that helps me get through that and move on. That's extremely helpful to have. And one thing I recommend to people too is to find a friend in a similar place, I guess, or even a further along ideally who can give, give you good advice and you can have accountability partners where you just check in once a week and you may have different business models and ideas, but you can leverage each other's connections. I actually have my friend out in Dallas and I'm in the Houston market. So we do a quick call. He's in real estate. I'm in real estate. I say, hey, what are you doing today to generate leads? I'm struggling with this. What do you think? Have you seen any solutions that may be able to help me out? And it's a great way to hold each other accountable in addition to having you know, a partner in the business. Yeah, I think that's brilliant, Chris. I, 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 think, uh, I, I think it's so critical. And you make a point of it. it has to be someone, though, that is done or is doing what you're doing. And ideally, kind of in, kind of in the sports 
thought is a little bit better or more advanced is also ideal. You're not going to get the same value from someone who isn't a business owner. It's great, you know, but we, we also need mom telling us how great we are, <laughs> but, but it doesn't, doesn't really help us. We need somebody who understands what we're going through. And that can be so difficult to do as well, because especially the parent example, we've grown up with our parents always telling us things. We kind of thought they were always right. right. I always joke my mom is actually English is her second language. So she's from Mexico and she would mispronunciate a few <laughs> words, you know, like spaghetti instead of spaghetti. And oh, yeah. I, would, I grew up saying a few words incorrectly, thinking that that was the right way. And so I always kind of use that as a lesson to when my parents are giving me advice about things that they haven't done. You know, everyone's got their two cents, not just my parents, but to really make sure are they qualified? Is the person giving you advice qualified to be giving you something worth listening to and taking into account in your own yeah, business? Absolutely. I grew up the same way, Chris. But, but also what you have to be careful with, especially early on or before you do jump into business is that Again, people are uh, the, your friends and, and people, coworkers, whoever you trust with this idea or this thought, they're, they're well-meaning, but they're going to project onto you their insecurities and their fears. And so we have to be very careful that we're not getting guidance from someone who's never done it before. Right. And they may be the closest ones to us have the best intentions, don't want to see us get hurt. So they're right. cautioning us to not take the risks and not put ourselves in financial situations like that, which really ultimately could be your path to financial freedom and escaping from such a, a life of corporate chains is what I like to refer to it as. Agreed. So how much time and effort would you say is needed to start a business? I know this is probably one of those. It depends. Whew. Yeah, uh, a lot. Uh, I <laughs> Listen, I have not figured out, and it, you know, I'm, I'm searching for it, trust me. I have not figured out a, another way than, than just to put in all of the effort that I possibly can into a new project. I try to get smarter and smarter every time. We just talked about leveraging experts and I'm getting better and better at that and not trying to do it all. But, but I would say it takes, you're going to work harder than you have ever worked if this is your first time doing a business venture. You will work harder and longer than you ever did in that corporate job, with some exceptions, I'm sure. I'm sure there are people listening who work ridiculous hours and that won't be the case. But it's different because you should want to put in that effort. You should be so passionate about it that you wake up excited to go and tackle it or work more on it or develop it or whatever, wherever it is you are in that phase. But then again, there'll be days when you're exhausted, right? So this touches on, begins to touch on, Chris, what are you willing to sacrifice? And we can go there next. But to answer your question, you're going to work harder. In my experience, it's harder than I ever have ever worked before to get a business launched. I think I've heard, I'm sure you've heard this quote as well. Entrepreneurs work 80 hours for themselves, so they don't have to work 40 hours for someone else. That's a great way to put it. But like you mentioned, when you love what you're doing and you're in that state of flow, you actually, when the timer goes off on your task, you want to keep working. Oh, yeah. It's, Whereas it's, when five o'clock hits in you know, someone else's uh, corporate role, you're like, okay, I'm out of here. I'm ready to go. Exactly. You, you should be obsessed about it. And that's one of the, going back to the questions as to whether the idea is right or whether you are ready. If you're not obsessed, I think is a good word about this idea, this project, because you're likely you're building it on the side, developing the idea on the side while you're still working. If that's not what you're up doing on the weekends and instead of watching TV or whatever else you sacrifice, then I don't know if you're ready. And if you're just in it for the money too, you hear this a lot, but it's true. If you're not passionate about it, you're just in it for the money. It's not going to work because you're not going to want to put in the, the extra effort required. I agree. Agree. There has to be a financial reward, but you're right. right. If that's your only focus, then you might be focusing on the wrong thing. Definitely. So another question I wanted to ask is once someone's started in business or someone who's already going down that entrepreneurial path, can you share what the most common reason is that businesses fail in your experience? Well, well certainly the most common reason is obvious. You run out of money. And so that Definitely. seems like a simple statement. But if we back up, the failure comes in the planning. So here's what I see as the biggest mistake people make. 
The reason they run out of money is they didn't do the right work up front in their financial projections. And where they cut corners, besides, you know, oh yeah, we're, we're definitely going to get a, a premium for this product or service, even though it hasn't been proven in the market. And yeah, we're going to keep our expenses in line. So we lie to ourselves about that. That's one thing. But where I see most small business cutting corners is in that working capital, that extra cash that you have to figure into any financial projection that's worth anything because you don't know what's really going to happen. It likely will take you longer to ramp up to your full revenues than you think it will. There will be things that will happen, delays that you cannot predict or expect. And so because we typically are tight on the money to begin with, that goes back to the point of, you know, are you financially ready? That's where we tend to cut corners and then we run out of money and then we're either tapping into resources that we shouldn't be tapping into, right? Our savings and the money that we said we weren't going to touch. And that's a, another story. When do we cut it off and move on? But that is the biggest mistake in my opinion. Sounds like you're talking right directly to me. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about this too with the product that I had invented where I started dipping into Good savings. Point. didn't really have a number in mind of when am I going to pull the plug or put it on the shelf and wait. So that is something extremely important to factor in because everyone always projects they're going to be doing X amount of sales within three months and they're not going to have employees or not have these costs that come up. And then you've got attorney fees and manufacturing costs, depending on the business that you're in that were unforeseen or that you grossly underestimated. Yeah. Yeah. I think in your example, what you have is, is a tough one because you were in love with this thing that you created. Understandably, you had to be, we just talked about having to be passionate but we have to separate the, the facts of the business and what it tells us from the passion or love we might have for something we invent. Right. It's like your baby, but at the same Articulate, time, right. the That's numbers hard. Are it's true. <laughs> that is the hardest thing to do. It's hard enough to quit on a business, but when you've invented something, boy, that, that's probably the hardest challenge for any small business owner. There's different similarities in um, various business models. Something that you put so much blood, sweat, and tears and time, most importantly, into, you feel like you're throwing it away when you, when you decide to do something else. I know. And, and it's that question, well, if I put in just a little bit more, we're almost there, right? Yeah. So that, that's critical. But coming back to your, your original question on this, what usually kills small businesses is that they're underfunded. That it's as simple as that. Now, there can be other factors, right? The timing, uh, things that are beyond our control. Uh, it was a bad idea. Those <laughs> things are obvious, right? But more than not, it's a, it's a lack of funding. Yes, the funding. And I, I mean, I've seen it happen to friends. You know, they've had to go back, raise other rounds. They spent more on a software development team than they expected for a certain product or it just took longer to bring to market and all of those things compile and kind of overwhelm people at times. So agreed. Funding is definitely a huge part. So what are some of the questions someone can ask themselves to know if they have the ability to start a business? Like, is it for me? How do I know? Mm -hmm. Well, we talked about the personal finance component and that, and just to revisit that quickly, you are not ready if you've got poor credit, if you've got a bunch of bad debt, uh, you're not ready. So the question you have to ask yourself, are you willing to make the sacrifice to get ready? Uh, and for, for most of us, again, my apologies to those who, who end up in that situation for circumstances out of their control, medical issues, a divorce, what have you. But otherwise, we probably got ourselves into that debt issue and what we have to have is the discipline to get ourselves out of it. If you go into business with your personal finances in disarray, I'm telling you, it's not that it can't be done, but you're going to carry that forward. The pressure then you're going to put on that business to have to pay you sooner than it can. And the underfunding that we just talked about, it, it's a higher risk and higher probability. So are your personal finances in order? Um, do you have the, the, the wherewithal, the, the credit worthiness? It's all related to that, right? Because if you expect to get a loan, nobody's going to lend you any money at any kind of reasonable rates unless your credit is in order. Um, we talked about worst case scenario. So asking yourself that question, what is your worst case scenario? And how will I recover if this business fails? How will I support my family? You got to be able to ask those questions. Right. Uh, another one we haven't talked about, Chris, is that do I have the energy and the health to get through this. Because as we covered, 
it requires an incredible amount of effort. So you really have to be ready for that, not just mentally, but physically, health-wise, because of what it's going to take from you to get that business to success. So those are some of the other questions that, that, I, that I think about when I'm trying to help people with that topic. And when you say the health, do you mean more like the stamina, just being able to go and be flexible, like work late at night one day, get up early the next day, put in the time needed, whatever it takes? Yeah, all of those things. I think that if you're bat battling an ailment, an illness, uh, it's, going to, it's going to be hard. It's not that it can't be done, but so, so you have to think, is, is this the right timing right now if I'm battling a serious ailment or illness? But it's also about beyond that, our personal health. Am I taking care of myself so that I can work those hours? Because that's, that's one thing that as a side note, I think I see a lot of people do is they, they were exercising regularly, eating well, but now these next three months, because things are so crazy, they threw that all out the window and are eating fast food because they don't have time. You can't do that because that will catch up to you. You need to be sharp and focused and high energy and be physically able to take on the challenges. I'm not talking about lifting boxes, but physically be able to endure and have the stamina, as you put it, to get through that, especially that startup phase. That is such great advice. And it's something that I've talked about on previous episodes because I'm very of the mindset of eating healthy, getting your workout in, sleeping the right amount of time to make sure that you're operating at 100% every single day. And I see entrepreneurs, a lot of people talk about hustle 24 seven, you know, sleep when you're dead, <laughs> grind it out now, eat ramen. And then in five years, you know, it'll be worth it. But if you don't have your health at the end of the day, if these decisions that you're making now in poor eating choices and not sleeping result in you not being healthy in a few years or having a heart attack at an early age, then what's the point of all of that, right? What's you need point? to be able to have some sort of balance to maintain uh, your health and optimize it. And I think when, you, when you're when you not, when you abandon that, I think it affects your decision making. I think it Absolutely. affects, because it affects your mood and your mental state. And that is not good because you need to be sharp and focused because you're going to have to make a million decisions and, and you're going to have to do a million different things. And the sharper you are, the, the better mentally, which of course goes hand in hand with how, how are you taking care of yourself. It's all about you got to put your best self forward to have a higher probability of success. Definitely. I actually ran into someone yesterday and they were just yawning and blinking. I guess they had been out late the night before, but within the five minutes that we were talking, they were literally just <laughs> bags under the eyes, yawning. And I was, you know, ready to go, ready to take on the day. Absolutely. And I was just thinking, what, what big of a difference? Like, it's such a huge difference between the energy that I'm feeling versus the energy she was feeling. And how much more am I going to get done because of this? I went to bed early. I had an early, you know, healthy breakfast. I went for my morning run. And she was probably out, you know, who knows, doing what until two or three in the morning. And maybe a little hungover. Those are, all those little things add up to affect your next day, which goes into your business and your personal life. Agreed, agreed. And, and not to, I don't know that person specifically, but I suspect they're not willing to make the sacrifices right. to get this done, whatever it is that they're, they're facing or challenged with or trying to build. That's an example of a sacrifice, right? Am I willing to adjust what had been my lifestyle before because I want this bad enough? So I'm curious, have you changed significantly mentally, like the mindset and everything since the corporate time? When did you start to read the self-help book, self -help books and start to change? Because even in the last two years, I think I tell my girlfriend, we've been dating for over two years. She's dating a different person now than when we met because I was still in the corporate role. I wasn't doing any self-development, no morning, morning uh, affirmations or yoga. A lot has changed. I have been reading self-help books. That's what they used to be called, really. So, I mean, I think there used to be an ex a section at Barnes & Noble called Self-Help, if I recall. I've been reading those kind of books since late teens. Um, and because you and I have talked about this, it's, it's an evolution, right? We it never is. get there. We, we should always be on a path of learning. 
So uh, now not all of it's sunk in right away, but over time <laughs> it sinks in. And what for me, and this is a particular challenge for me, I don't have great retention when I read. That's why I will highlight books. I will make notes. I'll go back and look at my notes. But what I do is I know is that a little bit of it does stick. And so cumulative, and that's why I read so much in part on the subject of business, other business leaders, successful people that I admire, biographies, self-help books, all of that over the years, I, don't, I can't count how many books I've read. You know, it's no, I, can't, I can't count them. I have a library full of books. So over time, they have changed me slowly but surely. As to specifically after I left the corporate world, you know, there, there was a lot there. I think the, one of the biggest things I've had to learn most recently, meaning over the last few years to get better at, is delegating and learning how to do that better. Now, it's not that you don't have that in the corporate world, because in fact, that's one of the bigger challenges when we leave the corporate world is we have a lot of resources, typically. You know, we have admin, and we have this department, and we have HR, and we have finance, and we can focus just on our particular duties. When you become a business owner, now all of that falls on you, right? Right. So learning how to handle all of that. But, you know, learning how to delegate and then ongoing is just an evolution. And same for me, if you, if you had met me... I would say 10 years ago, very different person than I am now. And I think it's interesting because have you lost any friendships or maybe grown out of old friendships just because you're no longer interested in the same things and absolutely kind of on to other things, right? Bigger and better. I mean, pushing yourself. Absolutely. When I, I've had opportunities in, in my life to talk to uh, troubled youth, different groups, because, you know, I grew up not troubled, but, you know, certainly very working class at, at best, right? Right. And you, you can appreciate this coming from a Latin background. Uh, the Cubans at least have this saying, dime con quien andas, tell me who you hang with, y te diré quien eres, and I'll tell you who you are. And that's that, so true. And that stuck with me very early on, because when I was a teenager, my parents got divorced when I was 17, a lot of turmoil in my family. I was hanging out with people, not that they were bad people, but they had very different goals and objectives and vision than what I had even at that time. And I learned the hard way pretty early that you have to associate with the right kind of people, right? There's all kinds of sayings and tidbits on this concept. We, had, we didn't come up with this, obviously, right. but it's been such a powerful thing. So yes, I have had to either lose friends or they have... I remember early on people saying to me, a couple of my friends saying to me, man, you're stuck up or you're arrogant or, and I thought about it for a long time and said, well, maybe I was a little bit, no doubt, <laughs> but I think more so it was, I'm, I'm going somewhere. I, I'm not happy with just, you know, this, this job, whatever it might be. I want more. So yes, I have lost friends and I've chosen to disassociate with some people because it, they're not going the same direction I am. And the hardest part, I think, with that is when you have family members that oh, yeah. I've got several cousins, like you mentioned, I mean, not to point names or anything, but they live in other states. Luckily, I'm a little separated from them where they don't rub off on me so much. But every time <laughs> I go and visit, you know, they're all kids at a young age before marriage getting stuck into situations where now they're having to work and trying to figure out how to make ends meet, living at their parents' house. And now they're kind of stuck in a difficult spot where they've set themselves up to be in a position where to get to where we're talking about and to get to that next level, they're going to have to dig themselves out of that financial pickle that they're in. So starting a business or starting something for themselves seems so far away because they're just trying to take care of today's problems. I agree. And, and that's hard, right? And again, listen, I, I could have had a bad turn here or there could have ended up in the same place, right? So I, I try, <laughs> we try not to judge, but yeah, you're so right. Um, about how life begins to happen to people. And then that becomes a real barrier, right? If we go back to the fear thing, right. if you've got, you're young and you don't have a career and you don't have an education and you've got a couple of kids and you've got a wife and you've got bills to pay, I, I get it. It's, it's, it's easy for me to sit here and tell you, you need to go start a business. That's, that's when you have to have the discipline and the, and the, uh, the courage to put a plan in place to get you there. And it might take you longer, but you can still get there, right? And it all starts with the decision, too. It's got to be that internal mindset. Someone can't just give you the idea. Even ideas are uh, just a small portion of it. Execution is everything. And that goes for any business, any startup, any big app that 
Uber, Airbnb, those all started as an idea. Sure. We have five friends that will probably claim that they had that idea five years ago, but that's right. what did they do about it? That's, that's what it comes down to. I think that's such a huge point. Yep. And well, we covered so much good stuff. I guess yeah. I wanted to see, did you have any other tidbits or information on uh, how to know when it's time to start a business that you wanted to talk about before we get into your business and contact info? Yeah, you know, I, I think we've touched on most of it. I think another way to look at it, we, we, you, you had asked me about and we covered some of the questions to ask yourself. But assuming the financial stuff is either taken care of, like we de described, or you have a plan in place for that. So that aside, um, are you at a point where you just, you just have to have this? You hate what you are doing. And furthermore, if you look out 10 years, you say, oh my God, is, is that going to be me? <laughs> is, is that what I want to do? Is that what I want to be doing? And, it, and, and if you do hate that and you just got to do something, then, then you know that you're probably already assuming everything else that we talked about is in place, right? Yes. And so what I would say to you then is put together, start your plan for how you're going to do this exit and take one step at a time in doing so. That, that's, that I guess would be the last thing I would suggest on that. Thank you. That's some great advice. And I know that could be another podcast topic yeah. <laughs> entirely on how to create that plan, which we, I'd love to have you on again in the future to maybe even talk about that. Um, that's something that I'm trying to figure out too. Do I start with the end in mind or do I just start at the beginning? I'm kind of fumbling my way through that, but yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, not easy at all. So Henry, can you share with our audience how they can reach you in any products or services that you recommend they check out? Sure. Yeah. The, the easiest way is to go to my website, thehowofbusiness.com. And so you'll find all the information about me there, my business coaching services. And also we've got a free download for your listeners and you'll find it there at thehowofbusiness.com. We'll, I'll give you the link to put in your show notes and it'll be a download with a bit more detail on this topic of what I, what I call, are you ready, willing, and able to start your first business? So that's a, a free download for you. You can find more information about my business coaching. So again, it's the howofbusiness.com. The howofbusiness.com. I will link all that up in the show notes. And entrepreneurs listening right now, be sure to go check out that resource. It's great. I read the entire thing when I was looking for questions to ask in this interview. So it's a great resource to have, even if you have a business now, to make sure you're asking those right questions that you may have skipped before you got started. So Good again, point. we covered so much today, Henry. Thank you so much for sharing your valuable insights from your years of personal experience. Do you have one key takeaway? If our listeners had to remember just one thing and implement today, what would that one thing be? Oh, that's good. We talked about so many different things, but if I'm thinking of the person who's sitting in that job, corporate or not, whatever, and they're, they're struggling with this desire to start their own business, I, I think that you have to really assess if you're ready and overcome, the biggest thing is overcoming that fear of failure. You got to get yourself past that and letting go of this perceived safety in a job. I think if you start there, then, then you're on your path. You're on your way. That, that plants the seed in the idea of knowing that there's more out there and the possibilities that await you if you take some more. Yeah. And you away. touched on something that's key as well, Chris ideas, I'm sorry to say, are a dime a dozen, okay? Yes. There are some exceptions. It's about the execution. It's about taking action. Everybody's got ideas. We think of them every single day, but even, you know, the million dollar ideas. I think I heard a story about the, the person who invented the fidget spinner, those little yeah. things that spin around. Yeah. I think the patent had been filed and had expired and someone else took that. That's and right. Made it what it was and it blew up. That's what I've heard. I haven't looked into the background or validity of the story, but stuff like that happens all the time. Agreed. Is there anything else you'd like to share real quick before I let you go? We've had uh, your contact information and everything, but just feel free to talk about anything you like right here. In no, this I think this is great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to chat with me and, and allow me on your show. I, I love your show as well. Um, listen, I can talk about business all day long, right? This is what I'm passionate about. <laughs> it's what you so love. That's these good. conversations uh, energize me. When I'm done with this, with this episode here that we've recorded, I'm more energized than when I started. So thank you for that. I, thank you so much as well. And I've noticed that, I know we both talked about that since we have our own shows. It's a great way for us to leverage knowledge from other people across the nation, across the world. 
and for me, for us to learn from each other in addition to teaching our audiences. So we're all yeah. learning things every single day. We just need to have a learner's mindset. So again, thank you so much for coming on. It's, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you.